Good morning, folks. Thank you. Uh, it's, folks are coming in, but we're going to go on and get started. If you're visiting with us, we certainly welcome you here. We encourage everyone each week to pick up a copy of The Messenger. There's an uh, order of worship on the front and a number of announcements uh, inside. On the back are meeting where our life groups meet at different times and places across the city and some of them have been taking a bit of a hiatus during the summer. They're getting ready to crank up. Uh, by way of announcement, I will mention that uh, my particular group is meeting at 5.30 tonight, folks, instead of 5 o'clock as is in print. So 5.30 tonight for the Sykes uh, life group. Make a note of that. I appreciate Eric speaking in my absence last week. I was away at a summer camp in North Carolina. I've been going there pretty much all of my life. When I, when I came to, uh, to Madison Street and was, was being interviewed, that was pretty much my, uh, my one non-negotiable item. I said, I want to continue this work. And uh, the elders in this church have been so gracious in uh, letting me continue that uh, through the years. We had a had a special needs camper that had been with us for 24 years and was uh, going to turn 49, uh, going to turn 50 this year and uh, was going to be at our week at camp and passed away just a couple of weeks earlier from a blood clot very suddenly, uh, very much beloved. I was able to go to his memorial service yesterday and just to see the, the great impact and, and the working of God where God's strength was made perfect in weakness. I was glad to be able to, to be a part of that, just to be in that, in that group. But uh, I, again, thank you so much for, for letting me have that as part of, of my life. I'm glad to be upright and talking and all of that after, <laughs> after a week of that. But we are certainly thankful that, uh, that, that you are here. We're going to take just a moment as a matter of fact, to continue what we were doing, but before, before we sing our first song, uh, let's stand and get ready to sing. But as we're standing, take just a moment and uh, speak, say hello to the people around you, and we'll sing in just a moment. Be back with you after traveling last week, and again, thanks to Eric for uh, stepping in here while I was away. Remind you to mark your calendars, August 14th. It's just three weeks away, our friends and family homecoming day. I hope you're making big plans for that. Wilson McCoy, one of our one of our own, is coming back home to speak to us. Uh, the uh, son of Larry and Glenda McCoy, he's in Lebanon right now, and just looking forward to him being here to teach combined class ages sixth grade and up at nine o'clock, and then our worship service at ten o'clock. We're going to be sharing a big potluck. We can use some help and some volunteers for that. The ladies are meeting together to sort of recreate a ladies ministry here and they're meeting this coming Saturday and that will be part of it but just looking for various volunteers to help that potluck flow smoothly and I know it's just going to be a great day August 14th so go on and put that down and we'll be hearing more details about that in the coming days you know very familiar passages of scripture sometimes can they can just go past us without us giving it much thought. And I want to focus on one example this week, and it's really a follow-up from a couple of weeks ago when we looked at that parable of the Pharisee on one hand and a tax collector on the other. And the Pharisee was full of pride, and the tax collector was literally humbling himself before God. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning, James 4 and verse 10. It says the words that are on the screen, let's say them together. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. We'll be singing those words in just a few moments, and I hope we really mean them as we sing them. You know, the Bible is full of stories of people who did just this. I mentioned a few for starters. I, one in particular that comes to mind, Numbers 12 and verse 2 says that Moses was very humble. He was meek more than all of the men on the earth. An old King James word, meek. You know, when I think about meek, uh, one thing that comes to my mind is growing up and, and reading comics, and in the comics there was Superman, but I hope I'm not to spoiler alert. <laughs> he had a secret identity. It's, it's Clark Kent. And, and Clark Kent was a meek mild-mannered reporter for the Daily Planet. And when you, when you think about meek, you think about weak, but uh, Clark Kent uh, was not weak. He was Superman with a shirt and tie and a suit. He just kept it in check. No one really knew it 
when he was Clark Kent, but it was there all along. You see, meekness is not weakness. It can really be power under control. But going back to, to Moses, one of the reasons that Moses was such a great person was because of his humility. And I think of so many Bible characters, as we call them, but people who were called by God who, at least initially, just were not raring to go for God to pick them. Now look at Moses, and here he is. He's a shepherd. He's out in the wilderness. He's been there for like 40 years just watching sheep getting away from it all. He's escaped Egypt. He's run for his life, and he's just living under the radar. God calls him. There's the burning bush. Who me? I can't do this. And excuse after excuse. But he ends up giving himself to God. I think about Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press because the Midianites have taken over and he's just, he's wanting to stay under the radar. God calls him. He answers the call. Amazing story. 300 men. I think about Jonah. God calls him. Jonah says, I'm going to skedaddle. But what happened in all of these instances is God was able to use all three because they humbled themselves, sometimes almost involuntarily, as in the case of Noah, and after some great difficulty. But learning to humble ourselves and let God use us, I think, is a, a difficult lesson. Uh, easier said than done. Easier sung than done. So for the next few minutes, what I want to do is take this verse. This is our text. And we're just going to sort of blow it apart, a little phrase at a time, and see what we can get out of it. The first phrase is this. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. Bow down. Now, that sometimes can fly in the face of human nature. I think almost by nature, most of us look at ourselves. We want what we want. Ask any two-year-old. We learn it quickly. Now, when the, the non-Christians in the first century would hear a phrase like this, humble yourselves, what they are hearing is this. Be a wimp. Be a weakling for God. That's not what the text is saying. How do we hear the verse today? Well, what it does, it challenges the need that we might sometimes feel in ourselves to be important. You know, those first century folks, perhaps some 21st century folks as well, would find it hard to understand why someone would just voluntarily give up power and accept a lower position. Oh, the Pharisees couldn't get this at all. They were so much into power and power structure. And we're in this political season right now. And there's this, this reach for power and grabbing after that. Many of the religious scholars of Jesus' day, they, they had trouble believing that if Jesus were truly divine, he would be living the kind of life that he lived. Because he lived this life of humility, so surely he couldn't be God in the flesh. If God ever came to earth, and if God ever were a human being, he'd be rallying the troops, and he'd be having the sword, and he'd be getting the armies together, and he would go against the Romans. And that's what you do when you fight nation against nation. But he said, said this, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight, but we're not fighting with swords and clubs. Here's what Paul had to say about Jesus. Some think this is an early Christian hymn, perhaps. Philippians 2, such familiar words. Jesus was in the form of God, but he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself, and he took the form of a servant. And he came in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And the reason our salvation can take place is because Jesus voluntarily took a lower position. So what the prodigal son did in this, this parable we looked at recently. He, he starts out full of himself. It's about me and dad, give me what's coming to me and I want my portion and I want it now and off he goes until he comes to himself and he's humbled by, by feeding the pigs and he's starving and he thinks back to his father and the status that he had. If he can just get inside the door, if he can just be a servant, he came to himself. Now the end result is the father says, you're still my son. 
And there he is. Centuries ago, the psalmist had this to say in Psalm 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These you will not despise, O God. There's some great lessons that we can learn when we are broken, just shattered, hard to see our way through. And then I'm reminded of this verse, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He'll lift you up. Apostle Peter put it this way in 1 Peter chapter 5, and verses 5 through 7, be clothed with humility. Wrap it around. That's the garment. That's what you wear. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all of your cares on Him, for He cares for you. Clothe yourself with humility. Literally, I think in, in the original language, I understand that he's talking about tying, uh, it's, it's related to tying an apron around yourself. That was, that was the garment of a slave, and a slave would wrap this, this apron around. It was something that a free person would never wear. And God's saying, you're my slave. You're my servant. When it comes to humility, tie one on. <laughs> and get ready for a change. But that's easier said than done. I'll repeat it. it. It flies in the face of human nature. But this is where it starts. Humble yourselves. And what God is asking for each one of us is to voluntarily submit. In the third chapter of Ephesians, Paul talks about bowing his knees before the Father. And, you know, I just ask this in a literal, not a show of hands, but in a literal sense. How often do you kneel? Some of you may kneel in prayer, or maybe once a day, or maybe on occasion, maybe never. There, there's something different about kneeling. A lot of small kids kneel. You may say, yeah, but my knees are not, <laughs> I understand that. And, and it's not about specific posture, but it is about a kneeling of the heart. You know, in some church buildings, you used to, in the old days, you used to see kneeling benches, actually. Uh, not a bad thing. I, I noticed more and more they got padded with thicker and thicker pads on those kneeling benches. But there's, there's something about just kneeling, certainly, in your heart before God. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. It's sort of hard to get in someone's face when you're... Uh, when you're on your knees. I like the way that Eugene Peterson has, has paraphrased this in the message. This is James 4.10, his rendering. Get down on your knees before the Master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. He'll lift us up. We've got to learn this lesson of humility. That's where it starts. Humble yourselves. How is this achieved? Well, I think the key is found in the next phrase. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humility is achieved in the sight, in the presence of the Lord, when we see ourselves as God sees us. When we have this awareness of His presence, of His watching, of His looking at us. When we compare ourselves, not with people around us, but with Him. And we realize that it's He who has made us, and not we ourselves, and we are the creatures, and He is the Creator. Know that the Lord, He is God. I remind you of a warning that the Apostle Paul gave to the church at Corinth. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. He said, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. But, and you see these words on the screen, they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves with themselves among themselves are not wise. That's what that Pharisee we looked at two weeks ago was doing. He looks around, he compares himself with his tax collector. And no doubt there were some virtues in that Pharisee's life that exceeded virtues in that tax collector's life. I understand that. That's not the point to be argued. But he was using the wrong standard of comparison. He stands there, and I do this, and I do that, and I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like that guy. And he wasn't. 
okay. And I can almost picture God saying, fair enough. And what's your point there? See, he's comparing himself to the wrong standard. What if he is in some ways, quote unquote, better than that guy? You want to make yourself feel good? Look around for someone crummier than you. And that's probably everybody, right? We got They're easy to find. Don't pay attention to those whom you think are better than you. And, oh, don't you feel so good? I'm better than she is. Well, I'm not doing what he did. Well, I'm one up on. They compare themselves among themselves, and they are not wise. They're comparing themselves to the wrong standard. And sometimes we may feel impressed with ourselves because we're looking in the wrong direction. What we need to do is humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. You know, compared to God, we're sort of like candles on a, on a sunny day. There we are. But, but He's God. And, and we are not. And we humble ourselves in His sight. In our, com in our humility, we need to be relying on God. Without it, we don't learn. We don't appreciate we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. He's our standard. He is watching us. And I go to these, these next two words. And He. And He. We need this. We need the and He in this verse. And how do we get to the and He? And the way we do that is through humility. You, you remember in Acts chapter 10 when when God called, told Peter, I want you to rise up and kill and eat these animals. The animals that Peter considered to be unclean. And indeed, uh, God had talked about them under the old covenant. But the new was coming in. And there was a time of transition. And God says, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, not so, Lord. Quick aside. Think twice before you say that to God, you know. Lord, I think you're... Lord, have you not read Leviticus lately? Could you turn here to this passage? And as long as Peter held to that answer, not so, Lord, he's losing access to and he. Because God is God. And he wants us to humble ourselves before him. Think about all the great things that Moses did. And, and Moses was meek in all the earth, but God calls him to this great task. And Moses answers, but unimaginable, all that Moses went through through the years and, and the murmuring and whining and complaining. And there was that, that, that fateful day where he just lost it. We got to get water for you, you rebels. Watch this and whack in this rock and go into the people and... And it wasn't a matter of technicality. Should you speak? Should you strike? You know, he said, now what God tells Moses is, it wasn't about the striking or the speaking. He says, you didn't humble me. You didn't, you didn't hallow me. You didn't humble yourself and hallow me and put me forth as holy. Moses, there was no humility in you on that occasion. He lost his access to the promised land because he lost sight of and he. God, by His grace, let Moses go in about 1,600 years later after he died, but not then. When we try to exalt ourselves, we don't leave much room for God to work. Never mind, Lord. I got this one. I'm taking, I'll call on you if I need you. I want you to be on standby now, just, just in case somehow something goes wrong. I, think, I don't think I'm going to have to do that, but... The reason Moses was so great, and yes, there was that occasion in his life, but it was because even after this initial resistance, he ended up letting God use him for his glory. And he's as meek a man as ever walked the earth outside of Jesus Christ. You want know to be great? Here's some advice. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. That's a lift we need. Listen to Jesus' advice in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, beginning in verse 11. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be abased, and he who humbles himself will be lifted up, will be exalted. Where does the journey to humility begin? Well, let's back up just a few verses in James. 
You already heard them read. Lonnie read them to us. Verse 7, if you've come to Vacation Bible School at Madison Street at Trenton Crossing, you may have run across James 4, 7 before. Resist the devil and he'll free from you. But it, but it starts this way. Submit to God. Therefore, submit to God. Whatever he says, that's what we're going to do. You submit to God. And as you're submitting to God, you resist the devil. He'll flee from you. He's a coward. You know, if you stand up to Satan, off he goes. Oh, doesn't mean he won't try to come back. But resist. We submit. We resist. Verse 8. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy be turned to gloom. And one thing that James is saying in these verses is this. The path to humility passes through repentance. We humble ourselves. Lord, I can't do this on my own. Purify your hearts. Cleanse your hands. Repent as we chase after humility. It passes through, this path passes through coming to God, giving ourselves completely to Him. And we're starting by, by repenting of our sins and, and coming to God in baptism. We, we offer that invitation publicly every time we come together. We're doing it now. We're going to sing this song in just a moment. We're going to sing these verses. If you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus, you can do that right now before we leave this place. In, in baptism, here's what you're going to do. You're going to get in that water and submit. You're going to submit your body. But for, for baptism to, to be the real thing, you're submitting your heart. I mean, you're submitting your body so much that you're put under the water. You're pulled up out of the water, almost like a, a death, a burial, a resurrection. You submit. You submit your body. You submit your heart. And as you come to that baptistry, you come with a heart that says, I repent. I want to be clean. I want to be like Jesus. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And he asks us to humbly come to him like, like the heart of a little child. James 4.10 says this, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Many of us have seen a lot of people lifted up out of that water of baptism. And again, if you need to do that this morning, we've got all the time you need. You may need to come and ask for prayers. Most of all, as we sing this song, I just hope that you, you look inside yourself and, and pray. Lord, make me the kind of person that I want to be. I want to do whatever I need to do to humble myself before you, to submit, to follow your will. If we can help with that in any kind of public way, come to the front, express your need. Let's stand, sing this old song.